Sorry, it was a what rum cake? Apple rum cake. Apple rum cake. So by default. By unanimous decision. Yes, unanimous decision. Karen is the winner of our recipe contest. Yay! And the prize for that is a wonderful four-on-one grafted kluwak with four varieties of very low chill, very exciting new kluwak varieties, or the equivalent value towards another purchase. So, uh, that's being offered to us by Dave Archer, Beneath the Creek Nursery, and is part of the special order fruit tree program that our chapter has the opportunity to participate in at a reduced price over the regular prices of this program. Again, the Special Order Fruit Tree Program is a really exciting program whereby folks can order any variety of fruit tree offered by Dave Wilson under that program. Uh, they need to get their order in by November 5th. And that's a deadline. And these are going to be at a 20% discount of where you would get them anywhere else. In addition, Bonita Creek Nursery is donating 10% of the sale to the chapter. So not only do you get a discount, but the chapter gets a benefit. Um, one more really special feature of that program is that the special order fruit tree program offered by any other nursery does not offer multi-grafted trees. However, we are going to make those available to our members Again, at a reduced price. However, that is a first come, first serve. And those are going to go fast. So if you are interested in multi grafted pluots, or any apples, or any of the things that were on your order form in the September newsletter, order them soon, because I can't guarantee they're still available. That's my question. I send the order in. Right away in September, how do I know if you got it or not? Contact Dave Archer. Contact David Archer. He's the oh. name on the bottom of that order form. Okay. And he's also in the October newsletter uh, with his phone number. Again, the question was, how do I know if I'm going to get this? We <laughs> will do our best to order that for you. Yeah, because I sent it right away. Right. And if it was available, we're going to do our best to get it for you. If not, we'll give you a refund. But we'll do our best to get it for you. So that's some really good opportunities to get some of these neat varieties that Tom are going to tell us about tonight. And something that's unique for our chapter. We haven't done this in the past, but Dave Wilson and Floyd Zager have uh, been producers of some of the top varieties of low-chill deciduous fruit trees for San Diego for many years. And I just found out today that there was a wonderful article on Zyger Genetics and Floyd Zyger in the North County Times yesterday. I believe. Was it yesterday, Tom? Is he, is he here? Yeah. There you go. It was yesterday. So if anybody gets the North County Times, uh, Floyd Zager has been a remarkable man for many years. If you don't know what goes into the development of a new fruit tree variety, it is huge in the amount of time and effort it takes. You plant, you have to pollinate, then you have to plant the seeds, then you have to select out of all of these hundreds or thousands of seedlings, and then you have to test, and then you have to spread around and test. And it takes, how long does it take to develop? 14 years. Minimum. So this is something that really takes dedication. And, and we owe a lot to Floyd Zager and Zager Genetics and to Dave Wilson for making these available to us. Really fun program.
Tom Spellman is going to be our presenter tonight. I'll tell you a little about him in just a moment. Uh, we do have an announcement regarding the nom uh, nominations coming up in November. Uh, what did I say? Nominations? I'm sorry. Uh, the election's coming up in November. And Rolf Deathlison has been our nominating chair. And I'm going to ask him to come up and tell you a little bit about the process and what he and his team have put together for our November election. Jim Neitzel asked me to chair the nominating committee for the November elections. The members of the uh, committee are Perusian Dad Bay, Dave Long, Frank Habertler, Richard Oswald, Karen Luck Lacomi, Robin Rivet, and June Anderson. The uh, nominations, as it stands now, are for the chair, Tom Del Hotel, for Vice Chair Jim Neitzel, for Secretary Mark Bendixson and Cielo Forth, and for Treasurer Eric Collins. My uh, question, are there any more candidates today? You have one more chance at the November meeting to declare a candidacy. We have about 140 members in this group. That means we need an effective organization, and that takes teamwork uh, from the offices. And uh, we're going to elect at the next meeting. That's it. Thank you for all your hard work, Rolf. We really do appreciate it. Uh, are there any nominations from the floor? We're going to have a draft. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I suggest we... If anyone is interested in volunteering on the board or being an officer or have, would like to nominate um, a candidate, Please contact Rolf. His phone number is in the newsletter, and you know we can we will be asking for the candidates to give a little uh, short description or paragraph of who they are and, and what they could do for us if that's appropriate. Unless there's only one candidate, but even so, I guess we should still do that in the newsletter. I'll let you know who everybody is. You know, most of them remember us, but I'm sure we have new people that don't. And, you know, we'll try to give you some idea of who everybody is and, and um, some of their abilities that they can help our chapter out with. Tonight, the opportunity table is going to take a little bit of a different um, direction. There we have been asked by the state to suspend sale of opportunity table tickets uh, due to a reporting issue to the state of California. And the state is going to be filing the appropriate paperwork for us. It's going to take a month or two to get everything filed because they're doing it not just for San Diego chapter, but for the entire um, collective of chapters that belong to California Rare Fruit Growers, and we need to get responses back from all the chapters who are going to have opportunity tables before that can be done. So tonight, the opportunity table drawing will be uh, made available to those members who wore their name badges and received a ticket, which has been our policy to give members who wear their name badges a uh, opportunity table ticket. So if you've worn your name badge and haven't received a ticket, uh, we'll make sure you got one, and we will have that drawing. 
with some really nice prizes up here uh, after the program tonight. One of the notices I did want to bring up is in regards to a notable pest that hit San Diego County about a month and a half ago, and that's the light brown apple moth. Light brown apple moth attacks over 200 fruits and vegetables and was of major concern to the San Diego area in terms of quarantines and potential damage to our agricultural industry. The good news is since the initial finding of a few moths, I think there was two, and then followed up by a third, there have been no additional findings. So... Okay, great news. Dodged a bullet there at this point. The quarantine is still in effect, primarily right around this immediate area uh, of Babylon Park. But we have our hands full with things like the Asian Stracillid and Diaprepes and fruit flies from time to time. Not right at the moment. Knock on wood. Um, we don't need another, although I'm sure we'll get more in the near future. They're getting new exotic pests every 60 days uh, here in Southern California, San Diego. So for the moment, we don't have a major concern with the light brown apple moth. Good news. If you do see something that you do not recognize, and you, know, you can bring it to your local nursery, um, Oftentimes there are people who can help you with identification. You can bring it to the Master Gardener's office up on Overland Avenue. A lot of times the entomologist at that uh, facility can help you out. Or you can get a free ID from the state. They have a form. You can bring it up to Overland Avenue, is it, Ed? Ed Hamilton, where are you? They bring it up to Overland Avenue and they'll identify it for you. Or if you're around the Home Depot in Lemon Grove, you can bring it down to me. And I'm pretty good. Uh, so I can, I can perhaps help you out as well. Um, but that's a great service, no charge, and they'll help you out with any identifications that you may need. Um, just a reminder, we still have need of a refreshment um, lead. If somebody is willing to help us out with the refreshment table, please let us know. And if folks can help at the evening, after the break, or after refreshments, uh, to help put things away and clean up the room, it would be much appreciated. Uh, we do have an opportunity to get, still get some wonderful uh, UV hats from Paul Fisher, Mount Merritt Nursery. Normally they are $26, and he's selling the remainder of his hats for $20. These are great hats. Uh, they're gonna last you five years, and I know it's cold, cooler now, but you know, great opportunity to get a really nice hat, and much better than what you can pick up at Food for Less or a lot of the discount places around which fall apart after a year or two. Uh, these are much better quality. So if you'd like to get a good quality sunblock hat, uh, this is probably one of the better hats on the market at a great price. So thank you, Paul, for making that available to us. At this point, I'd like to ask, are there any announcements from the floor? Is anybody uh, planning on going to the uh, Macadamia Association um, what's the word for it? It's a, a, a day, day long uh, yeah. thing up in uh, Oli um, where is it? Fall, uh, it's uh, just below Fallbrook. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyone in East County that's going? That you know, I was planning on going. Gary Bender is going to be the presenter, and uh, it's um, from I think 8:45 till 1:30 in the afternoon or something, and. Uh, if anyone's going, I'd like to kind of write up. So Dave will be out there on the street putting out his thumb. Otherwise, I'll drive. <laughs> it's a week from this Saturday. Yes, Jim. The work party at San Diego Botanic Garden at Quail Garden. Um, this next month, I think, will be the first Saturday of the month rather than the second. And
Anyone else? Um, what is the persimmon trip? Persimmon picking trip? We do have our calendar of events over here on the uh, pillar. November 6th. Six. to our last meeting vote and the two proposals which have gone through. Yes. The school programs have been approved by the membership to uh, develop for the use of the Paul Thompson Endowment, or a portion of it. And I've been in contact with the San Diego Master Gardeners who already have a school outreach program in place. They are working in schools from Tijuana all the way up to Vista and have about 200 volunteers that go out to schools and work on classroom projects with those schools. And we are currently developing a collaborative um, proposal where we will work, the California Rough Fruit Growers San Diego chapters will work together with San Diego Master Gardeners to help uh, thrust forward this program and some of the things that we were hoping to do in this development. So I'll have updates for you right now. Uh, we're, st we're still in the beginning stages of that cooperative endeavor, but that's going to be really exciting because now instead of having to start from scratch, we have somebody who we can our uh, help get some momentum and get things going without having to reinvent the wheel. So that's going to be a really great way to get this program moving forward fairly quickly. Um, again, we do have a couple of other ideas and things coming up by the philanthropy committee or as the name is being proposed to change the uh, Research and Education Development Committee. Uh, we would really love your input. And so if you have thoughts, ideas, suggestions, please come to the meeting, which is the third Wednesday of the month in room 104 over across the hallway. Or put your notes in the suggestion tree over here behind the pillar or contact Dave Long, who is our chairman committee. Um, and, you know, we really would like to um, meet the needs of the chapter in the development of these programs. So if you have ideas, please help us out and give us your input. Um, one last announcement that was in the newsletter I want to remind you of, and you should have gotten a... Karen was in a half-page flyer that she handed out regarding the change of membership period for members. It's a, the chapter has been talking about changing the membership period for several years to a calendar year basis where everybody's renewal period will become due on January 1st. And it will run from January 1st to December 31st. This is really going to simplify our lives as members because instead of having to remember, if you're anything like me, when did I renew? When does my membership expire? I don't remember. And oh my gosh. Uh, this will make it easy. Also, make it easy for our membership chair. There is a half page informative brochure as to what this entails, how it will be implemented, what it means to you, 
You should have all received one when you came in and signed in at the membership table. And again, if you have thoughts, suggestions, comments, questions, please either see Karen Lacomi at the membership table or drop a note in the uh, suggestion tree or contact a board member. This will be voted on at the November board meeting and everybody who wants to attend the November board meeting is welcome to come and give an opinion uh, before the vote's taken. But this is something that we've been talking about for years and would really, uh, if you have any strong feelings or thoughts on this, would like to hear from you. So take a look at it. If everybody's great and good with it, wonderful. If you have ideas or thoughts or questions, please use those venues in order to address your questions. Any other comments or announcements from the floor? Jeff. There are uh, all kinds of apple varieties for people to sample tonight. Uh, Ambrosia is a super duper tasty mushroom apple that I think everybody will like, which is from Canada. But all these others are mostly lower chill varieties that I think uh, you will enjoy sampling. And on each table or each plate, there's uh, a name so that you can know what you're sampling. Then the other thing largely are the beijoas, which is a fruit from Brazil. That's why the J is a J instead of a H. <laughs> And uh, they're very nice to eat with a teaspoon. If you cut them in half and just scoop out all the flesh. But some of the varieties are from quail gardens, uh, like mammoth and mammoth and so forth. Uh, Triumph. I don't know what all the, them are. Anyhow, uh, see what you like. And uh, I think they do have something. If you're going to plant something for a screen or whatever it may as well make it something that's going to give you fruit. And for you know, it can be pretty nice. It can be wonderful. One variety was developed by one of our members, Gary Lickver, is called Lickver's Pride. It's one of my favorite. Um, there are some others. We have Che. We have some more really wonderful things. You know, Jim mentioned apples, and we're called the California Rare Fruit Growers, and people often ask, well, what's a rare fruit? Well, rare fruit is relative. When I began my nursery career, and I won't bother telling you how long ago that was, <laughs> but when I began my nursery career in San Diego, there were maybe four or five apple varieties that we promoted and said could be grown in San Diego. Not very many. If you looked in the Sunset Western Garden Guide, there was maybe four or five varieties. Today, I grow at least a dozen different varieties of apples in my yard in Lemon Grove, all of which are less than 300 hours of chill. And there are many more than that. Uh, pretty exciting. So a rare fruit is something we don't commonly grow, and apples are still part of that. New varieties are being discovered all the time. Eric Collins is doing some really fun things with cider apples. And that's something that a lot of us have never grown. We don't know the chill hours. He's going to be our testing station to tell us which of those varieties are good for us. So what's a rare fruit? Anything new to the area. It may be a new variety. It may be new to the region. But rare is all relative. And with that, we're, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker. When we talk about rare... Well, you may say, well, what's rare about a peach or a nectarine or a plum? And that may have been true at one time. But thanks to people like Floyd Zager and a few other very innovative plant breeders, Luther Burbank, they started doing some really interesting things of hybridizing these 
common fruit. Starting with things like hybridizing cherries and plums and coming up with cherry plums and peach and plums and peach and apricots and plum and apricots. And some of those first things were called pluots. Uh, excuse me, plum cots, which were half plum and half apricot. And then they took that and they crossed it with an apricot. And now you have apriums, which are three-quarter apricot and one-quarter plum. And they took the plum cot and they crossed it with the plum. And they developed pluots, which are three-quarter plum and one-fourth quarter apricot. And this year, we have a new peach cotton. Now talk about rare. Who ever heard of a peach cotton? Which is a peach, plum, apricot hybrid. And this new variety is supposedly wonderful. I've never had one, but perhaps Tom has. <laughs> And he could tell us a little bit about that. And so, Tom, come on up and let me introduce you and give you the opportunity to talk about who you are and what you do. Tom and I have been longtime friends, and he used to work with Laverne Nursery, which was a premier grower of subtropical fruit. They did a huge amount to bring a lot of subtropicals to Southern California. And Tom was responsible for a lot of that. A lot of that. And what, about five years ago, you moved to Dave Wilson? Nine years ago. No? Yeah, time, time flies. flies. Uh, about nine years ago, Tom had an opportunity to go to work with Dave Wilson Nursery, which he took, and he is now uh, one of the. Be careful. He's one of my best contacts with Dave Wilson Nursery and one of our top promoters and experts of the deciduous fruit line that Dave Wilson uh, makes available to us. And so I want to thank Tom for coming down to us tonight to tell us about Dave Wilson and what they offer. And everybody give Tom a big hand. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I was thinking a little earlier when, we, when I first came in and we were talking about how long we've known each other, and it, it, I, I it uh, occurs to me that we must have met each other when we were like four or five years old. <laughs> now, I don't really remember how I drove down to Chula Vista when I was four or five years old, but somehow I seemed to pull it off. So it's been, uh, it's been a good run. My 20 years with Laverne Nursery and my nine years with Dave Wilson, it's all been fun and working with some of the greatest uh, you know, fruit people in, in the Western Hemisphere. And, um, I really appreciate an opportunity to come down here and, and be able to speak to you guys about what's new and exciting with us at Dave Wilson Nursery. And even some varieties that have been around for a while. I'm, I'm, what I'm going to present tonight are new and improved varieties and also old-fashioned varieties that have a good reputation in San Diego. Um, did any of you see my presentation at the Festival of Fruit back in August? Good. Then everybody, this will be new to everybody. <laughs> First of all, a little bit about fruit hybridizing. You know, Tom touched on it there a little bit, and um, Floyd Zager, who I get an opportunity to work with on a regular basis, is one of the most amazing people that I've ever met. He has um, second-generation ties to Luther Burbank. Um, Floyd was uh, introduced to fruit breeding by a gentleman by the name of Anderson, and Anderson worked directly with Luther Burbank. Um, Fred Anderson is pr probably considered um, the father of the modern-day nectarine, those were his uh, hybrids. The first nectarines to come out were all developed by Mr. Anderson. And uh, Luther Burbank, of course, is, is renowned in what he's done in the fields of fruit breeding, from, uh, from cactus to potatoes to plums and just about anything you can think of, Luther Burbank had his hand in at one time or another. Luther Burbank did something very important for the deciduous fruit industry over 100 years ago. Luther Burbank was the first person to successfully cross a plum and apricot. And what Tom said about that was that was called a plum cot, and that's exactly right. It was an F1 hybrid. It was 50% plum, 50% apricot. 
And even as we look back at some of Burbank's varieties today, like Santa Rosa Plum, uh, Santa Rosa Plum definitely has apricot genes in it. So it's not actually a true plum, but it's actually a plum cot. So uh, the, the most common plum grown in the world today by far, Santa Rosa, is actually uh, truly a, an interspecific hybrid between plum and apricot. Well, that was where Luther Burbank left off, was with an F1 hybrid. He never really took it any further than that. So when Floyd Zager joined in to fruit breeding about 50 plus years ago, one of the things Floyd wanted to do was he wanted to take off where Luther Burbank had stopped. So he took uh, F1 hybrids of plum and apricot and created many, many of his own and still has some phenomenal plum cot hybrids out there today and began to uh, back cross again. So he would take a, a, a plum cot and he would cross it with apricot. And not once, but maybe five times or six times or ten times. So what the crosses that Floyd has now may be F10, F9, F8, F7 hybrids. They've been, they've been hybridized over and over and over again with varieties that showed superior characteristics for one reason or another. And they weren't always characteristics of fruit. They might have been a characteristic of disease resistance. It might have been a characteristic of adaptability. It might have been a characteristic of precocity, uh, able to produce at a young age. It might have been for color. It might have been for uh, skin thickness. It could have been for any one of a number of reasons why he used the varieties that he used in his crosses. What, what he's been able to come up with over the last uh, 30 years for sure is probably the most impressive group of interspecific hybrids that anybody in the world has ever seen. And they're varieties that are grown today all over the world. His, um, his first introductions like uh, Dapple Dandy Pluot, Flavor King Pluot, uh, Flavor Supreme Pluot, those are all varieties that have been on the market now for well over 20 years and um, are actually going off of patent now, so they'll be available for you guys to propagate in your backyard uh, and uh, not get my blood pressure up when you do it. So. Uh, all those things are going to be coming available you know, fairly soon, plus just a, a wealth of, of, of new varieties that, that Floyd has developed over the years. So we'll, um, we'll get started uh, talking about something else that Tom mentioned, and that was apples. Um, one of the most adaptable fruits out there today are really apples. And we used to look at apples, for the most part, as being high-chill varieties. In fact, if you look at um, varieties like Fuji, when it was brought into the United States back in 1960, Fuji was rated at 1,000 chill hours because they, they didn't know. They didn't know any better. So Fuji was grown in Northern California and Oregon and Washington, and people liked it. So pretty soon it was in uh, Sacramento, and pretty soon it was in uh, San Jose, and pretty soon it was in Fresno, and before you know it, it's in San Diego. So we now know Fuji to probably be no more than two or 300 chill hours. It's adaptable to almost every climate we've ever grown it in. And, and to be honest with you, We've really done a complete reversal on the chill requirements of apples in general. I personally don't believe there is any such thing as a high chill apple. I think any apple can be grown in almost any climate. The most important consideration, and this, this goes with, with most fruit varieties, is having a rootstock that is adaptable to your soil, adaptable to your climate, and aids in precocity, aids in early bearing. So if you grow Fuji on a standard apple seedling, it's probably going to take you somewhere between five and ten years before you ever see a fruit. Standard apple seedlings are, are vigorous and aggressive, and they, there's really no reason for that tree to want to produce fruit. That tree ha is not in, in any type of um, uh, shock or jeopardy or stress, and, and, and fruit production is a result of physical stress. So if that's a big, healthy, vigorous, fast-growing rootstock, it's going to take a long time to produce fruit. So rootstocks that have been bred with a little bit of an incompatibility, like the Malling series of apple rootstocks from England, just a little bit of an incompatibility. Malling's 111, Malling's 7, Malling's 27, uh, Budlovsky 9, varieties like that that have come out of, of European trials have just a little bit of incompatibility, not enough to um, dwarf the plant by much more than maybe 20 to 50%, but enough to aid in precocity, enough where that standard Fuji that's going to take five to ten years to produce will now produce in a year, two years, or three years. So I want you all to take into consideration the next time you're buying any kind of a fruit tree. Number one, make sure that, that the rootstock that that tree is grafted onto is compatible with your soil type and compatible with your climate and 
probably has a little bit of a, of a dwarfing character or a little bit of an incompatibility so that you're going to get precocity. The more vigorous, fastest growing varieties are not always the best selections for your area. And there are a lot of varieties that are semi-dwarfed or, or um, aid in precocity that actually have attributes that are, that are better than that. They'll take heavy soils, they'll take wet soils, there are rootstocks you can grow in lawn areas. So every particular rootstock has an attribute that you want to follow. If you buy a, a, a Fuji apple and you don't know what the rootstock is, you really only know what half your tree is. You don't know whether it's going to grow well in your area or not. You don't know whether it's going to be a big giant tree and you won't see fruit for 10 years or whether it's going to stay compact and you'll get fruit in four or five or six years. So pay as much attention to the rootstock that your trees are grafted onto as you do to the cultivars that you're planting. So let's talk a little bit about adaptable apple varieties. I, um, I have probably trialed um, 20, 22, 23 different apple varieties in my yard, and I, I honestly have had fruit off of every one of them that I've ever planted on a good Molly's 111 or Molly's 7 rootstock. I did uh, plant, uh, the first pink lady that I planted was on a standard uh, apple seedling, and uh, to this day, that tree has not produced any fruit for me, and it's been in the ground now for nine years. So make sure you're planting a variety that's going to give you capacity. Make sure you go, you're going with something that's going to work for you. Here's the man, Luther Burbank, that early fruit hybridizer by one of his uh, thornless nopales. And um, you know, Luther's done some tremendous things for us, as we, as we mentioned. Um, next slide. Here's Mr. Zager, Floyd Zager, one of those guys that I will uh, take any opportunity that I can to spend time with. Floyd is, um, I think he's uh, 85 or 86 years old now, and he still spends seven days a week in his orchard. He's still out there constantly. All of the uh, fruit breeding that Sagers do, uh, every year they do um, isolated pollination crosses. So they'll take uh, 60 to 70,000 hybrid crosses every year and, and grow on that fruit and plant those seeds and grow those seedlings on in a four-year seedling block for evaluation. So those, those 60 or 70,000 times four, at any given time, Sagers have a quarter of a million trees in the ground under evaluation. So if you want to become a fruit breeder, you need some space, and you need some time, and some people to work with you, and you need to be able to look at a lot of trees, because out of that quarter of a million trees that they have under evaluation, they may select eight or ten to go into a, a future trial. No, usually no more than no more than maybe a dozen to 15 varieties in, in any given year go into future trials. And once that four-year trial period is over, they go into a 10-year evaluation block before they're actually released as a, uh, a patented variety to the commercial fruit trade or for, for backyard growers. So every tree that Zagers has developed that you see on the market today went through no less than 14 years worth of evaluation before it was released. So varieties like Flavor King Pluot, which are now uh, have now been around for 22 years, actually are 14 years older than that. So this is, this is Floyd's life. This is what he's done. This is what his family does. This is what he's dedicated uh, all of his life to. And, and let me tell you, he has about 300 different patent fruit varieties now, more than anybody in the world by far, probably more than the five top fruit breeders in the world combined. And uh, he's got some pretty special varieties that we'll talk about today. This is Floyd's daughter, Leith Gardner, and she um, manages the business, the Zager Genetics business in, in itself. And she's out there almost every day with Floyd. They do um, weekly walkthroughs in the orchard every Wednesday during fruit season. They walk the orchard with people from, uh, oh, people from nurseries, people from uh, fruit marketing and packaging companies and wholesale produce distributors and grocery store chain buyers and you name it and, and evaluate whatever's ripe that week. So from about April 1st until usually about the end of October, in fact, they just did their last walkthrough last week, uh, they're evaluating fruit every single week out in the orchard so lots of different things coming up. This is Dave Wilson and John Wynn. Dave Wilson started uh, Dave Wilson Nursery back in 1938, and he started it with uh, a few dollars that he had borrowed from his uh, father-in-law and a, uh, a, a loaned pickup truck and a shovel. And Dave started to plant uh, rootstock uh, seedlings out and graft trees for the uh, commercial orchard industry. And Dave Wilson Nursery is now the largest grower of fruit trees in the United States. Uh, we produce about, this year we'll have about 5,750,000 fruit trees that will come out of Dave Wilson Nursery. 
Uh, John Wynn was Dave's son-in-law, and he took over the business uh, back in the 19, late 1970s. Okay, let's talk about varieties. Dorset Golden Apple. Dorset Golden is actually a variety that's never been patented. Dorset Golden was a found selection that came from the Bahamas. So it doesn't get much lower chill than the Bahamas. <laughs> uh, you know, if they get 20 or 30 or 50 chill hours a year, that would be probably an overstatement. So uh, Bahamas is probably give back chill if you, if you follow the uh, National Weather Service's uh, requirements for chill hours. So Dorset Golden um, has a lot of great attributes. Number one, it's self-fertile. It's, it's a nice, firm variety. It doesn't require any cross-pollination. Holds its texture real well. It's also, it blooms for an extended period, so it's also a great pollinator for other early varieties that require cross pollination, like Anna. So if you have a Dorset Golden and an Anna together, your crop's going to be considerably larger on both, and your Anna fruit's going to be fully pollinated and considerably better quality than it would be if it was non pollinated. Uh, Dorset Golden has, has only really one setback that I can think of in Southern California, and that's it doesn't want to go dormant. It wants to be an evergreen. It wants to hold its foliage on a, on a year-round basis. And, and what that means is strip it. if you're not paying attention to disease control and you have an apple scab problem or a powdery mildew problem and you don't set your dorset golden fully into dormancy, that problem is going to replicate itself early in the spring because your new growth is going to come out and it's going to reinfect itself. So my recommendation for dorset golden and Anna strip. is if they don't go dormant, make them go dormant. Strip, strip them. them. Yeah. Take your hose, take a high-pressure nozzle, Blast them out, get all the foliage off that you can. I mean, I'm even out there picking foliage off, and that's, yeah. that's another reason why a nice compact tree comes in handy. I don't want to climb 20 feet to strip my apple foliage. So. Um, Dorset Golden has it, it, all, all attributes, no real faults, except the fact that it doesn't want to go dormant. But that's easy to make it go dormant. You've got a great apple variety. Early season, it's ripe in uh, July. I've had people tell me it's ripe in June. And uh, it's usually July, August for me. and then. Um, after that, the next variety that comes in is uh, Fuji. An old line Fuji, you know, came from Japan back in uh, about 1960, 59 or 60, and has grown to be, uh, at this point, probably the most popular apple variety in the world. Uh, Red Delicious used to have that distinction, but let's be honest, who wants to eat a Red Delicious? <laughs> Why eat a Red Delicious when you can have a Fuji? Fuji is a, is a great variety, again, self-fertile, a good pollinator for other mid and late season varieties. It has a um, wonderful, crisp uh, flavor, nice character. It's just you know one of those varieties that really has everything going for it. Even though it's self-fertile, again, it does better with a cross-pollinator. So if you have uh, a Granny Smith <coughs> or a Pink Lady or a Jonah Gold or any other you know mid-season bloomer, you're going to get a better crop on, on your Fuji and on your other varieties too. So Fuji's kind of a mid-season producer. August, September, October, even into November they hold pretty well. So you can you can get almost four months worth of fruit off of a good Fuji. And that's that says a lot. There aren't many stone fruits or palm fruits that are going to hold their, their crop for four months, but Fuji's definitely one of them. Good late season producer, Pink Lady. Pink Lady is an extremely reliable variety. Pink Lady is very, very low chill like Fuji and Dorset Golden. In fact, again, I think all apples are low chill. Uh, it's just a matter of getting, getting those varieties that are precocious and going to produce for them. Pink Lady is a late season producer. It holds on the tree forever. I can usually eat Pink Lady in my orchard when I'm doing winter detail pruning in January. They're still hanging on the tree. They're still good quality. They color up really nice. They flavor up really nice. Pink Lady is kind of one of those exceptions to the rule. There aren't many apple varieties in Southern California that are really going to color up well and taste good, but Pink Lady is one of those varieties. It, do, it uh, doesn't need to chill. It doesn't seem to need the cool nighttime summer temperatures like most varieties do to color up well. It'll, it'll pick up good color almost anywhere. In fact, Pink Lady is the most popular apple in Las Vegas, Nevada. And Las Vegas, Nevada, in my opinion, is the fruit tree graveyard of the United States. <laughs> More varieties that fail there than have failed anywhere and Fuji's bulletproof. It doesn't mind the heat, it doesn't mind the wind, it doesn't mind the stress. It blooms late enough that, that the crop comes on the tree. It's not susceptible to sunburn. It does extremely well out there and, and produces a great crop late season out there. So if, you're, if you want to grow a good desert apple, that's, that's a winner for you right there. Pink Lady uh, will produce fruit uh, October, November, December, January, again, another four months. So if you had Dorset Golden, Fuji 
and Pink Lady together as a three-in-one, you could pretty much expect to harvest six to eight months' worth of apples off of those, uh, those three varieties alone. That's one of the things that's most important to backyard orchard culture is having that successive ripening character. You don't want all your fruit at any one time. You want a little bit of fruit all the time. So having three good varieties that will produce for six months plus, that's, that, that's a winner. What are all those, three of those varieties. What are the three varieties on. again? Dorset Golden, yeah. Fuji, and Pink Lady. Did you get my handout on the back table? Yeah. Okay, they're all listed on the handout. Okay. Every variety I'm going to discuss is on the handout. Will this be uh, best on an M27 or M111? Uh, Either one. Either, Either one. one. Just don't okay. get it on a standard because you'll never see a fruit. Okay. Um, I'm still waiting for my fruit. On my <laughs> and actually, I've grafted it over to other varieties. I just left one branch of Pink Lady on it. Still well, mo seen. Most of the apple rootstock then is from East Malling uh, in England. Most of the, mo the mo more popular selections of apple rootstocks today are all Merton Malling selections, yes. Okay. Uh, Malling's 111 is the most popular apple rootstock in the world in the by world. far. In fact, if you, took, if you took all of the other Malling selections and standard apple rootstock and com compared them to the amount of Malling's 111 that's grown, Malling's 111 would probably still be the dominant variety. Yeah. So you grow literally millions of Malling's 111 every year. Okay, next slide, please. Apricots. One of, the, uh, one of the things that Zagers has done over the years is they've really worked to try and extend out the fruit seasons. And, and we'll discuss that more in detail as we go along. Apricots are typically the first stone fruits that ripen up. You could expect to get apricots in Southern California anywhere from the end of April through the end of June. So there are lots of varieties that ripen up in May and June. You've got, you know, Blenheims and Katie's and Goldkist and, and you know, Nuggets and, and just, you know, a tremendous amount of varieties. So what everybody was really looking for, you can't get much earlier than, than the end of April, but you can get later. So by, uh, by uh, crossing apricots with some of the Middle Eastern varieties that, that are sour apricots or ume varieties that are sour apricots that ripen later on in the season, and then back crossing with uh, good flavorful varieties again, Zager was able to come up with two late season varieties. So Autumn Glow is the first one, and Autumn Glow in, uh, in my orchard ripens up from about July 15th until about August 1st. So after all the other apricots are gone, Autumn Glow comes into play. It's a nice freestone. It's a light colored fruit. It um, looks like it's uh, definitely low chill and, and self fertile. It's been grown in isolation without any pollinators and still produces a good crop. So um, you can grow it pretty much anywhere. But again, if you have it with another apricot or an apricot, you're going to get a better crop on it. And uh, it's a really nice quality piece of fruit. One of the nice things about late season fruits is they really develop their sugars well. Uh, the more heat that they get, the more those sugars develop. So that's why some of our early peaches and apricots and plums and things that ripen up in, in May are sometimes kind of lackluster because they don't have enough heat to really ripen up yet. So the varieties that can hold on the tree longer are always going to develop good flavors and characters. Uh, right in line after Autumn Glow is our next variety. And that is, um, oh, you know what, actually I've got those reversed. Early Autumn is... Um, the end of July to the 1st of August, and Autumn Glow is the, the later variety, which is about August 1st until about August 15th. So there's, there's, an, there's two apricot varieties that are going to extend out your apricot season by a month. And that's, that's pretty incredible. That's uh, much, much later than anything's ever been uh, used before. And, and these are not, actually, these are not apriums. These are, these are true apricot selections. They don't have any plum in them. And they still look to be uh, low chill and very adaptable and, and completely self fertile. They're standard trees. Well, if they're or uh, are they or are they onto. dwarf? Either one. Okay. They could be grafted onto my okay. Roble and 29C or uh, Demagard and, and grown as a standard, or grafted onto Citation or or um, uh, Pixie or something like that and grown as a semi dwarf. But you know, there again, uh, whether it's a standard or a semi dwarf, size control is still up to you. And I would still recommend that you choose. A rootstock, not for not for its dwarfing capability, but for its adaptability to your climate and soil. Because you know the wrong rootstock, whether it's a standard or a semi-dwarf, is still going to be a dead tree eventually if it's, it's it's in the wrong place. So make sure you're using rootstocks for their adaptability to your climate and your soil. So there's our the, our apricot extensions. Now here's a new one. This is pixie cotton. This is a this is the first Nect successful genetic dwarf apricot. For those of you that are familiar with genetic dwarf peaches like, you know, Bonanza and Honey Babe and nectarines like Nectar Babe and Pixie and things like that, they stay real short, real compact, very tight 
inner nodes, very you know short little stubby growers and, and heavy producers. Well, this isn't exactly dwarf like the little peaches and nectarines. It's kind of a semi-genetic dwarf, where a standard apricot which is probably going to get up to 20 feet high and 30 feet wide. This is probably dwarfed by about 60 or 70 percent. So it's probably going to stay below 10 feet, and it's probably going to only, you know, probably not get any wider than 8 or 10 feet wide. So it's, uh, it's certainly genetic dwarf by those standards. Uh, again, you can keep it any size you want by pruning. But this was the, we, we, we've trialed genetic dwarf apricots like you can't believe. We've trialed at least in the, in the nine years that I've been with Dave Wilson, probably no, no less than 100 varieties. And quite honestly, I can tell you, I've, I haven't liked any of them. I thought the, the flavor was, was poor, the set was poor, um, you know, the bloom times were short, they had, they had all kinds of issues. The adaptability was poor. This is the first one that I've ever seen that I can honestly say blooms for an extended period, is, is reliably self-fertile, uh, you know, good cross-pollinator with other varieties, and a nice quality, very edible, very respectable piece of fruit. So if you like, appreciate a good quality apricot and want a more compact, stubby tree, this is a good one for that. Next Apriums. Now, apriums go back to Zager again, and, and uh, what Floyd had uh, done was he we took the old Luther Burbank's F1 hybrid plum cots and crossed them again with apricot, maybe five times, maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. So an aprium. Tom had said 75% apricot, 25% plum. Probably m more accurate descriptions on, on an aprium would be probably 90% plus apricot and about 10% plum. And really, the only things that plum have really added to the, to the to crosses in aprium, really only one thing. And I, people will tell me all the time, oh, I tasted an aprium and I can really pick up the plum flavor. Well, you know what? I don't pick up the plum flavor at all. They're apricots. They're 90 percent, 95 percent apricots. What the plum did is it gave them adaptability. Plums are one of the most adaptable stone fruits out there. Apricots are one of the least adaptable stone fruits. So now we've got apriums that you can grow on the Big Island of Hawaii, or Yuma, Arizona, or uh, Boise, Idaho, or Woodstock Valley, Connecticut, because they're adaptable to all different types of climates because of that little bit of plum parent. So apriums, the, the plum parentage that went into apriums was strictly for adaptability. Really doesn't lend much at all as far as fruit character. But considering the, the inadaptability of most apricots, here's a variety you can grow anywhere in Southern California. You can grow it in the mountains, you can grow it in the desert, you can grow it in Point Loma, you can grow it right here in downtown San Diego, and it's gonna be successful. And cotton candy is a, uh, a light pigmented variety. It's almost a blonde variety little bit of a yellow color to it. Very nice flavor and a very good mid-season producer. And because of their bloom adaptability, they're also great pollinators for any other apricot. So if you have uh, autumn glow and early autumn and a Blenheim and a, and a, a gold nugget and then you have a cotton candy apium in there, there's your super pollinizer right there. Not to mention it's a great quality piece of fruit. Uh, this was the first aprium that Floyd released, probably, in fact, I believe uh, Flavor Delight goes off patent this year, so it's another one of those varieties that you could uh, graft and not get my blood pressure up. Flavor Delight is uh, completely self-fertile. It's a uh, very early season. I've had them as early as May 1st in my yard. It uh, blooms for an extended period, so again, another great pollinizer. Uh, certainly, probably, you know, as low chill as you can imagine. In fact, I think we've We've uh, downgraded it again, I think, between uh, like to one to 200 hours, so it's going to produce pretty much anywhere. And again, uh, you know, the adaptability of uh, Hawaii, Yuma, Arizona, and Boise, Idaho. So, you know, pick your climate and, and get a rootstock that's adapted to your climate and grow yourself a nice apron. And they'll produce everywhere. Uh, nothing bad to say about aprons. They're, they're super fruit and they're, they're all, you know, just as high in vitamins and, and minerals as, as an old line apricot. And, just, you know, just again, that, that plum really doesn't do much for flavor or consistency of the fruit. It gives it adaptability, and that, that was the most important thing to consider with apricots. <coughs> Mini Royal and Royal Lee. Cherries have always been one of my pet peeves ever since I got into the nursery industry when I worked for Armstrong's back in the 1970s. 
everybody wanted to grow Bain cherries and black tartarian cherries in Southern California, and we used to sell them by the truckload. Everybody bought cherries, and everybody failed. In fact, they'd come back three or four years later, and they'd say, I ripped out those cherries. They didn't do any good for me, so I'm going to plant two more. <laughs> so people planted cherries and cherries and cherries, and, you know, Lappin's maybe is semi-successful, and Stella's semi-successful in Southern California. They're nice varieties, but when these two varieties hit the market, uh, which was nine years, nine years ago they were released for testing. They've been on the market now for, for this is the, their third year of release to retail. So I, I've had many Royal and Royal Lee in, in my test plot for nine years, and I'm in an area in uh, uh, North Upland and I get probably in an average year maybe 100, maybe 150, maybe 200 chill hours, but I don't think it's ever really been any more than that. I've never seen a ground frost on my property. Uh, just, it just doesn't really get cold there. Bananas don't freeze and, and things like that. So, Mini Royal and Royal Lee produced their second year in the ground and have produced every year since. Uh, this year on Mini Royal, I probably had 1,500 cherries and I probably had four to 500 on Royal Lee. Uh, Mini Royal is a Bing type. It's bigger than Bing and it is, is a dynamite piece of fruit. If you want a good quality, reliable sweet cherry for low chill, Southern California, you grow these two. They, they're, they, they're not self-fertile, so you need to plant the two together. So Mini Royal is the first one and it ripens up for me about May 15th, uh, probably through the first week in June or maybe the 10th of June. And then the next variety, Royal Lee, is the pollinator. Uh, the growers up in the San Joaquin Valley, for some reason, were originally they preferred Royal Lee. They planted a big acreage of Royal Lee in the Bakersfield area and put in Mini Royal as pollinizers. And they realized right off the bat that uh, Mini Royal was really the better quality piece of fruit. They're both good, but Mini, Mini Royal is better. So why, why they ever thought that Royal Lee was the better piece of fruit is still a mystery to me. I, I, I like Mini Royal right out the gate, but this is the pollinizer. You, know, you definitely need to have this one along with it. And the nice thing about this one is it produces later. So after the mini royal's done, about uh, June 1st to maybe June 20th or 22nd, you got mini royals. So, so you can plant like four to one uh, mini could, royal absolutely. and then one royal leaf for the pollinizer. Yeah, you could put in three or four mini royals and, and one royal leaf and, and expect you know good, good pollination. Now, I'll tell you a little trick with cherries. Cherries don't like it down here. They don't like to grow down here. They're really, really picky about their soils on almost any rootstock. So cherries, if you're going to grow them, in, in especially if you have a heavy soil, put them on a mound, get them raised up, get them up a three, four, six, eight inches above grade. Better would be 12 inches. Better would be 18 inches. Get them up above grade so that you have a nice area up above the, your native soil line that can oxygenate. The worst thing you can do to cherries is put them in a lawn or put them in an area that stays wet all the time. If they don't get drainage, they're going to be gone in, in no time. One, two, three years and they're dead. So get them up, get them raised up, get them in a good loose soil. And if you've got a heavy soil, don't kid yourself by digging a big hole and planting them in a sandy soil because you just dug a big bowl. That water's still going to stay there. So get them up above your native soil line. Get them up on a mound, get them up in a raised bed. 12 inches above your native soil line, they'll last a long, long time. But, e but even with that, cherries are going to be short-lived trees in Southern California. I wouldn't expect them to do good for any more than maybe 10 years. But you know, with, if, if I'm getting 1,500 fruit off of my mini royal and it lasts 10 years, I'm perfectly happy with that. I'll buy another one. So um, mini royal and royal lee are the only good, reliable sweet cherries in Southern California. Uh, we really don't know how low chill they are, but they're, they're in, tr in some trials in um, New Zealand and South Africa and areas where they don't expect that they have any chill at all, and they still produce a good quality fruit. I think we rated them this year at at either three to four hundred or two to three hundred. I know we just downgraded them. Our new, our new variety description just downgraded them by another hundred hours. So, uh, for all practical purposes, they don't really need any chill at all. They're good, reliable varieties. For Southern California. Now, on top of having the two leading low chill cherry varieties for Southern California, we also have the new um, three CR rootstock from Zager, which is a genetic dwarfing cherry rootstock. So this rootstock will hold cherries back by two thirds. So if you had a 30 foot uh, mini royal on Mazard, now you've got a 10 foot on uh, Zager Dwarf Root. So a uh, really nice uh, stable rootstock for 
growing your sweet cherries on. It's uh, just marketed as Sacred Dwarf Cherry Brew. The number, I think, is 3, 3CR178, and it'll be available this year with uh, Mini Royal, Royal Lee, Lappin, Stella, Bay, Black Tartarian, and uh, Rainier. So all those varieties will be available. Uh, most of the nurseries down in Southern California are carrying uh, Lappins for sure, and then uh, Mini Royal, Royal Lee, so you should be able to buy all of those. Oh, nice, another nice thing about that Zager Dwarf root, it seems to be more susceptible or more uh, resistant to uh, to uh, collar rot and crown rot. So it seems to take heavy soils a little better than most of the standard or semi dwarf cherry root stocks that are out there. And it hasn't been trialed for a long period of time. I've only had it for two years, so I can't I can't say that for sure. But if, if you if you do have a heavy soil situation, it looks like this root stock is going to take heavy soils better than most. <coughs> Arctic Star White Nectarine. This was one of the reasons I wanted to come to work for Dave Wilson Nursery. Mm. About 20 years ago, I tried my first Arctic Star Nectarine, and I basically couldn't believe it. You know, I was familiar with Panamint and, and Snow Queen and Goldmine and, you know, the brand and all these varieties that have been around for years and years and years, and they're all good. In fact, Snow Queen's great. There are a lot of really good Nectarine varieties out there. When I first ate an Arctic Star, it was just like, What's going on with this? This is like a whole new piece of fruit. I mean, it's just an, an incredible flavor and a very reliable producer. Great color. It's got it's got everything that a commercial grower would want in a great piece of fruit. You know, gets nice size, shows some disease resistance, uh, blooms for an extended period, self fertile, great color, not susceptible to splitting, not susceptible to cat facing. Uh, it's just a good low chill Southern California self fertile nectarine with a tremendous flavor. If you guys don't have Arctic Star, if you haven't tried it, it's certainly one that I would recommend that you put in. Yeah, Jim. Uh, one thing that I, I found uh, out the hard way is that you have a very short window in which to get it sprayed. Absolutely. I, I would say prunus in general, peach, plum, nectarine, apricot. You know, I, I always try and do two dormant sprays during the uh, season. I usually do one the first week in December. And I usually try and do one as soon as my early varieties like Florida Prince and, and Dorset Golden and Anna and Desert Dawn Nectarine start to show popcorn, you know, bud swell. And, and that can vary considerably. You know, sometimes it's before the middle of January. If we have a warm Santa Ana condition, uh, we get, er, you know, early bud break on those. So you definitely want to make sure that if you want to get two dormant sprays on, you don't let it go too long. So first one should be early December, even if the, the foliage hasn't dropped yet. And that's going to set them into dormancy also. And then the next one should be right at the point where your earliest varieties show bud break. And Arctic Star will be one of the early varieties too. So you can use it as an indicator plant. When, when those early varieties start to show popcorn bud stage, you want to get everything sprayed and get it done quick. Okay, next thing. Double Delight Nectarine. You know, one of the things that uh, we've really tried to do with Dave Wilson over the last few years is we like we like this program we call Edible Ornamentals. And Edible Ornamentals are, are fruits that are superior in quality, that uh, have a great or better than average ornamental appeal. And Double Delight is one of those. Double Delight has a big, beautiful double pink flower, blooms for an extended period. So. You know, if you were just growing a early pink flowering peach or a peppermint flowering peach, you'd get a flower that was equivalent to what Double Delight is like and the period that Double Delight blooms for. But then you've got this. You've got this great mid-season yellow-fleshed freestone nectarine that, that's low chill and self-fertile and, and has done tremendous in our, in our taste tests over the years. So, you know, here's a, here's a great dual-purpose variety. It looks beautiful. The tree is easy to manage, and the fruit is much better than average, so... A good quality nectarine on a nice ornamental tree. Snow Queen, I just talked a little bit about Snow Queen. Snow Queen's actually an old um, Armstrong variety, and uh, I think uh, Snow Queen was a cooperative effort between uh, Armstrong Nurseries and uh, Mr. Anderson when he was developing his first nectarine. Snow Queen definitely has some Legrand parentage in it. Uh, it's very low chill, it's very self fertile. It's it's not uh, a sub-acid variety like Arctic Star. It's, it's a good balance. And, and you know, for me, really, nowadays, so it's, so it's kind of I really color. like my fruit to have a good sugar to acid ratio. Yes. I, don't, I don't really like sub-acid fruit in general. They're just they're too sweet, and they don't have a whole lot of, of flavor. 
Uh, Snow Queen's not like that. Snow Queen has a good, true, late Legrand or Legrand type nectarine flavor, a good sugar to acid balance, free stone, very reliable, self fertile, um, low chill, very Southern California adaptable. The only problem with Snow Queen nectarine is it's susceptible to a phenomenon called cat facing. And cat facing is uh, on the sunny side of the fruit, it, uh, it blisters and blemishes and splits. So, uh, you know, on, the, on all the snow queens that are really facing south, southwest, and get that hot part of the afternoon sun, you're probably only going to get two-thirds of the piece of fruit. But you know what? Eat two. Because they're really, really good. They're really nice flavor. They're really reliable. Uh, snow queen's been one of my favorite varieties for many, many, many years, and it, and it always will be. It's really, really hard to beat for a good, um, balanced, you know, acid to sugar fruit. And um, actually... Um, Zagers has agreed to uh, do a little bit of research for us on Snow Queen. So they're going to go back in to Anderson's old records on hybridizing of Snow Queen, and they're going to isolate the gene that makes Snow Queen susceptible to cat facing, and they're going to breed it out. So sometime in the next 10 or 15 years, hopefully, we'll have a Snow Queen that's not susceptible to cat facing anymore. And as long as they don't take anything away in flavor, I'm perfectly okay with that. If the flavor is anything less than what it is right now, quite frankly, I'd rather have the old one with the cat face in it. Question? Does Arctic Star have some acidity to it? Not much. Not much. Arctic so Star is like uh, Arctic Star is, a, is definitely a sub acid piece of fruit. Okay. <laughs> but but I've had I've had you know more sub acid strains. There are certainly other varieties out there that are even less acidic than Arctic Star. So Arctic Star is you know I, I wouldn't consider it acidic at all, but there are varieties out there that are even less than that. So. Okay, next slide. Sazi King White Nectarine. This is a result of Mr. Zager's breeding of um, nectarines and pinto-style peaches. For those of you that are familiar, I'm sure, with uh, donut peach. Donut is uh, actually, uh, everybody thinks it's a fairly new variety. Donut's actually an ancient variety. It was growing uh, in the Emperor's Garden of China more than 550 years ago. So uh, donut peach, uh, or what they call Stark Saturn, the first pinto-style peach to be grown in the United States, was actually imported by Stark Brothers back in the 1930s and uh, released as their pinto-style peach. And about uh, 20 years ago, Frida Kaplan from Frida's Finest Produce in Los Angeles decided that it should be marketed as uh, the trade name, under the trade name of donut. So in respect to Frida Kaplan and our catalog, we call it Stark Saturn Donut. Donut is actually a trademark name of uh, Frida's Finest Produce. Uh, very good quality piece of fruit. And this is the first nectarine that has that pinto style parentage in it. And it's really a good variety. It's low chill, it's self fertile. As you can see, it's not a freestone, uh, which uh, pintos are about 50 50. Some are freestone, some are clingstone. But it certainly has a, a, a very good flavor and is a very reliable producer. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, it is self-fertile, but I've certainly noticed that if you have another nectarine or peach variety close, your production will be better. And I think most of you have more than one peach or nectarine variety, so you probably won't have any trouble with, uh, with getting a good crop off it. And the only setback to this variety is um, it's uh, susceptible to stem tearing. And that means that where the stem meets the top of the fruit, uh, oftentimes when you pick the fruit, if you don't give it a good twist, You'll get a you'll get a tear on the on the skin, and that's okay if you're going to eat the fruit right then and there. But it's not going to last for any more than 24 hours or so when you bring it inside the kitchen. So when you're picking any pinto style fruit, a twist. most fruit in general, it's a good idea to give it a twist, a quarter twist or a half twist to get that stem to break away from the fruit before you pop it off the tree, and that eliminates about 90 percent of the stem tear. Uh, white tiger nectarine, this is actually one that came out of a, uh, it, was a it was a variety that was a lost variety, again, from uh, probably originally from China. And uh, it was something that was uh, reintroduced to the trade by, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of the nursery. It was a nursery up in Oregon a few years ago. Uh, Rain Tree, thank you. Uh, they uh, reintroduced it and we, we took it back on. It's a really, really nice piece of fruit. It's uh, Free stone. It has that nice, almost a plummy kind of a blush to it, and it has a, just a really aromatic kind of uh, fragrance and a nice perfumey 
you know, aromatic smell and a great flavor. It's a really nice, nice piece of fruit. Um, I put it back in my collection just because I thought it was special enough and different enough to have. And, um, you know, if you want something a little different and a good white flesh nectarine, this is certainly one of them. It also seems to me, uh, and, and I haven't confirmed this with anybody else yet, but uh, in, at least in, in my yard, every few years, I do a little experiment, and that is about every fifth year, I don't dormant spray. And I just want to, you know, I don't dormant spray because I want to see how varieties will react to it. And usually I'm uh, completely overwhelmed with peach leaf curl and powdery <coughs> milk and apple scab and all those wonderful things when I, when I don't dormant spray. But this variety, uh, I, I didn't dormant spray this year, and this variety, White Tiger, didn't seem to be affected by peach leaf curl. So I don't know. I don't know whether that's going to hold true, whether that's actually going to be a, a, an actual long-term character, but it's a nice piece of fruit. It's a pretty pink flower. It has a really nice fragrance and a nice flavor, and I think it's a worthwhile addition. Spicy Nectaporn. Now this one, how many of you are familiar with Spicy Nectaporn? A few of you. Get familiar with it. This is, this is um, what I would consider to be Zager's most important interspecific introduction since the original Dapple Dandy blew up. And that goes back well over 20 years. And he's introduced a lot of different varieties. This one has it all. This one has got everything going for it. The, again, the plum parentage in spicy nectar plum is probably almost non-detectable. It's really only there for adaptability. So here you've got a, a nectarine variety, white flesh nectarine variety with a red blush, freestone, large size fruit, that'll produce anywhere we've ever put it. Any, every trial that we put in, it produces well. Low chill, high chill, high humidity, no humidity, desert heat, it doesn't matter. It also has a uh, semi-double pink flower, and it also has a red leaf. And that, again, comes from some sort of plum parentage like Hollywood or Thundercloud or Newport or something like that, which may very well be in this parentage somewhere. So. Um, and it, and it seems to be a fairly disease-resistant variety, although it did pick up peach leaf curl this year. Um, the flavor's incredible. It's a really nice piece of fruit. And the nicest thing about this, the plum also gave it the uh, ability to hold well on the tree. Now, there are some plums that don't hold well at all, and there are other plums that really hold well. And whatever plum they used on this absolutely had a holding ability, because I, I can pick this as early as mid-July and as late as September 1st. So here's, here's a nectarine variety that will hold for seven or maybe even eight weeks on the tree. That is unheard of in any nectarine or peach. Nothing holds that long. But here it is. So spicy nectar plum, incredible flavor, low chill adaptability, some disease resistance, ornamental appeal with the double flower and the red foliage, good sized fruit, uh, you know, nice color, freestone. Uh, I haven't found anything that I don't like about it. So this is a great one to put in for that extended period and just to have a really good quality piece of uh, mid to late summer food. The Pride series, I think this is, a, this is probably another one of Zager's uh, crowning achievements in, in, uh, in peaches. There's actually a whole series of, of Prides. There's August Pride. Well, let's, let's start at the beginning. There's May Pride, which ripens up in May. There's Eva's Pride, which ripens up in June. And there's Mid Pride, which ripens up in August. And, or uh, July, and August Pride that ripens in early August. So with the four Pride peaches, which are also available as a multi-bud, you can have uh, three, three months worth of peaches. Nice, big, uh, freestone, Alberta-style, yellow flesh peaches. So August Pride is one that um, the Orange County people all liked it. You know, we, we, we tried it and uh, trialed it and, and gave away some trees to the Orange <laughs> County chapter 15 years ago. And, and uh, you know, everybody that has it has, has uh, done well with it and really liked it. It's one of those varieties that just really picks up the flavor and really picks up its character and has a nice true, true, you know, acid to sugar balance and a nice peachy flavor. <coughs> uh, August Pride is, uh, you know, along with the other three prides, is, is a good selection. But even if you didn't have the other three, this is definitely a worthwhile peach to have. Donut white, uh, white pinto style peach. We talked about that. The one the Stark Brothers brought in. Frida's put her uh, donut trademark on it. Uh, ancient variety, over 550 years old. Very adaptable, too. Very low chill and very adaptable. These are all varieties that will adapt to uh, almost any climate. So, I've seen this one in trials in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. 
uh, Big Island of Hawaii, Yuma, Arizona, Boise, Idaho, um, <coughs> Minnesota, up in the, in, the, in the Great Lakes region, and uh, northern, in Chicago, and Minnesota, and, and uh, Wisconsin, and uh, Woodstock Valley, Connecticut. Seems to grow just about everywhere. San Diego, California, it's got a great reputation down here. So. And this, you know, the flavor on this, if you guys are, have ever really had a good tree ripened donut peach. It almost has a real mild almondy flavor. So it's a real, real appealing flavor. A real, real nice sweet uh, selection. Eva's Pride, this is the, uh, the June variety out of the Pride series. You can see that cut fruit there. It almost has kind of a raspberry modeling to it. And I, I don't like to uh, pick favorites really in any category, but if I had to pick a favorite peach, if I had to pick one peach that I could that I could grow, and I could only have one peach from now on, would probably be this variety. Mm. This variety just really shows, uh, you know, really good flavor. You know, there there is is not a June variety of peach that's going to be any better flavor than this variety. Very reliable, very heavy producing. In fact, it's it's a branch breaker if you don't thin it. So uh, you know, make sure that you pay attention to that on some of these varieties. They are heavy producers, and if you don't get out and thin and thin early you'll either end up with a lot of small fruit or you'll end up with uh, broken branches. This is not a freestone variety? Yeah, it's freestone. Oh, it is? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, they're all, all those varieties are freestone. But this one, this one is really, really a special variety. Uh, you know, I would say if I had to pick one peach, this would probably be it. At least if I had to pick one peach for June, this would definitely be it. Red Baron, this is another one that falls into that edible ornamental category. If you've never seen the um, flowers on Red Baron, they're just absolutely striking. It's bright red, big double flowers, uh, really nice, uh, beautiful long bloom period on the tree. It's low chill, it's self fertile. The only setback with Red Baron is the fruit, once the fruit's harvested, it doesn't last. So when, you, when you've got Red Baron, you want to make sure when you pick it, you're going to use it right away. It's ripe uh, late July and into August, so it's a nice uh, mid to mid late variety. But once it comes off the tree, you've probably got about 24 hours and 36 hours to to use it, and um, it, it holds reasonably well on the tree. You'll get at least two, if not three, weeks out of it, unless we get a heat spike during its ripening period. Then, then yeah, any fruit is going to ripen up all at once. But in general, if the weather's typical, you'll get uh, at least two weeks out of red barren. But the most spectacular thing really is. The fruit's good, the quality's good, free stone, low chill, reliable, heavy producer, but when you see this tree in bloom, it's phenomenal. Absolutely beautiful specimen. Sweet bagel peach, this is another um, interspecific uh, peach using uh, pinto style. And this one actually, this is not a Zager variety. This is probably the only patented variety that I'll talk about tonight that didn't come from Zagers. This actually came from a um, breeding program uh, that the French government conducted back about 15 or 20 years ago. And the nice thing about sweet bagel peach, it's not a freestone, but it's huge. I mean, it's, it's literally the size of a coffee cup saucer. Mm. So the, you know, they'll develop a really nice size and a really nice flavor. And it's a late variety. It ripens up. Uh, for me, I had them this year until about September 15th. So from, the, you know, from early to mid-August until about the middle of September. It's a good variety to extend out your season. Uh, nice flavor. Again, it's susceptible to that stem tear, so when you harvest it, give it a twist. And it's a good idea on these varieties to thin them early. Even those four fruit right there together like that, probably too many fruit together. I'd like to see all these about six to eight inches apart, and that way you're not going to have the problem with, uh, with the fruit you know, rubbing against each other, and you're not going to have uh, mealy bugs or scale or anything that's going to colonize in, in, in those cracks and crevices. If you've got good single pieces of fruit, it's always easier to deal with than clusters. Hey, we don't always get out thin. Thinning's a big chore, and uh, a lot of people don't want to do it. So this will give you a reliable size, whether you thin or not. Uh, good quality peach, nice late season. Burgundy plum. This this would definitely be my. If I had to only choose one plum, what would it be? This would this would be the variety. Burgundy plum has everything going for it. It's low chill. It's self fertile. It's um, a reliable pollinating variety for other pluots and Japanese style plums. It blooms for an extended period. It will give you um, an extended harvest because it blooms so long. It'll literally bloom for me for five or six weeks. 
So it's going to give you five or six or seven weeks worth of, of harvest. We can pick it as early as the very end of July and pick it sometimes as late as the end of September. So, you know, several weeks worth of good, reliable harvest off Burgundy. And it has a great flavor. It doesn't have that bitter uh, flavor to the skin like Santa Rosa and mm -hmm. some of the other varieties you're susceptible to. Uh, it's just a really nice, good, edible quality. Dark red interior, dark red exterior. Uh, super reliable plum. So, you know, if you're going to plant one, if you're only going to plant one plum, this should really be it. Going to give you the, the most bang for your buck, and, and it's, the, you know, the most reliable variety I've ever put in. Hollywood plum. This is one, this is actually an old uh, red leaf ornamental variety that we just brought back in this year because we were able to pick up a superior fruiting clone on this that, that had a larger size than normal. Hollywood plums were about the, typically about the size of a ping pong ball, you know, so, you know, maybe, maybe so big. And we found a um, selection in the Midwest that um, had a considerably larger fruit, even uh, almost uh, twice as big as the average Hollywood plum. You know, reliably free stone, low chill, self-fertile, dark red interior, dark red exterior, Bright, bright red foliage on the tree. Pink blossom instead of a white blossom. So really nice edible ornamental and, and a good quality piece of fruit. You could grow this as a street tree or grow this in your front yard and, and people wouldn't even pay attention to it. They wouldn't even know that it had fruit on it until the fruit becomes to, uh, begins to ripen up. In fact, the birds don't even notice it because it's got a red leaf. So they don't see the fruit. You got a green leaf and a red fruit, they're all over. You got a red leaf and a red fruit, they don't see it. So this is a really nice variety if you don't like the bird net too. So uh, we just brought this back in, the Superior Fruiting Clone. It'll be introduced for the first time um, this season, for the 2011 season. So it'll be available in January. Uh, some, of the, some of the newer Pluot varieties I really like, and Emerald Drop is at the top of that list. Emerald Drop has, um, has a, just a, an incredible flavor. It's, it's got you know, some, some incredible genes, and just is a really, really nice quality piece of fruit. It ripens up in um, pretty much through the month of July and into early August for me. It uh, blooms for a long period. Its recommended pollinator is a variety called uh, Splash, although we, you know, we really feel that it's probably going to um, pollinate with just about any of their fruit or, or most plums even. Santa Rosa, late Santa Rosa, uh, Burgundy will definitely pollinate it, so you can grow it you know, with plums also. But, uh, just a really, really nice flavor. Just you know, a, a good sugar to acid balance, a good snappy, aromatic flavor. You know, once you take a bite out of this, you'll never forget it. You'll always want to go back to this variety. Flavor finale. This is definitely the latest Pluot variety that's on the market right now, and um, I just ate flavor finale um, last week when I was up in Northern California. So we were picking it. We were picking it last week uh, at Zager's on, on Wednesday. And uh, they're really nice quality piece of fruit. I wish there would have been more. I would have brought some down, but there were only probably 30 or 40 fruit left on the tree that they had, and there were 25 or 30 of us there, and <laughs> pretty much stripped the tree. So, and, and my tree's only a uh, first year in the ground, so I didn't get any fruit out of it this year. But you know, the, the latest flew out. Uh, nice, nice quality fruit, very you know, late in the season, good, um, reliable season extender, uh, no, no bitter pit, no, uh, no bitter uh, skin, you know, definitely has uh, probably some Santa Rosa in the parentage there, but uh, it has the latest gene that I've ever seen for a blue hot, so really, really good, good quality late season piece of fruit. Anything that you can pick in, in, the, in the middle to the end of October is pretty incredible. Mm. Flavor Grenade, actually just uh, just ahead of Flavor Finale, I picked Flavor Grenade uh, in my orchard in Upland, starting about, you know, I mean, you could pick it earlier. You could pick it in, at the end of July or early August, but I like to let it go until about the end of August and pick it through September. And I probably had a few fruit in the, end of the first week of October, so, you know, good mid-late season variety. Um, this is our champion variety this year at the South Coast Field Station in Irvine. We did a low chill pluot trial down there, and this one literally uh, just produced like like a madman. I mean, it had so much fruit on the tree, and we thinned and thinned and thinned, and it still had just an incredible amount of fruit on the tree. They all sized up, they all colored up. They were really, really good flavor. This is one of those varieties that, when I first looked at it, 
which probably goes back 15 years on a, on a Zangers tour with my friend Ed Leibel before I even worked for Dave Wilson Nursery. Uh, we, you know, we were with Floyd looking at this tree and he hadn't released it yet and he said, well, why don't you guys try this one? And, and you know, I took a bite out of it and I thought, man, what a, what a great piece of fruit. The only thing that I'm sad about on this variety is it obviously has, I said this to Floyd, it obviously has European plum in its parentage somewhere. I don't think it's gonna be low chill adaptable at all. And Floyd shook his head yes, and he said, you know, he goes, um, it definitely doesn't show me any signs of being a low chill variety. But, I, but then I said, on the other hand, I, I, I'd like to try it for you. So he gave me a tree and I took it down and put it in my yard and lo and behold, second year in the ground I had fruit. Third year in the ground, I had fruit. I've had fruit ever since. Hmm. So this is this is probably one of those varieties that's you know it's a hundred hours or maybe 150 hours chill requirement, um, and it's a really nice late season piece of fruit. So you won't you won't find too many that are that are as good as this for the season. In fact, you won't find any that are as good as this for the season. Nice flavor, nice nice tree set, um, you know, great great extended uh, season variety. Just an incredible piece of fruit once you once you try it. Okay, flavor King Pluot. This is this is out of Floyd's first three varieties that he ever released. Um, holds well on the tree. Goes from this this bright orange color in, in uh, late July to a beautiful dark red burgundy color at the end of August, and, and holds until you know maybe early September. Produ I mean, this thing produces like grapes. It's also a very very low chill champion. Doesn't seem to require any chill at all to be very very productive. No pluots are self-fertile. They all require cross-pollinization, which is interesting because all of Floyd's other interspecifics, apriums, nectoplums, cherry plums, picotums, most varieties like that seem self, to be self either self-fertile or semi-self-fertile, but no such thing as a self-fertile pluot, not even close. Every pluot we've ever done in isolation doesn't produce fruit. But plant it with another pluot, plant it with burgundy plum, plant it with late Santa Rosa, you have all kinds of fruit. And the nice thing about fluos, they're available as multi-buds. You can get two different sets of multi-buds and have eight different fluots on two trees. So, uh, there are varieties from, from Flavorosa that ripens up in, in uh, early June to the Flavor Finale that ripens up in October. So you can have fluots all summer. Here's uh, Splash. That's the variety that I told you about that's the recommended pollinator for Emerald Drop. And this, is, this is also an early season variety. It ripens up in June. Uh, right after uh, Flavorella or Flavorosa, and a uh, good quality piece of fruit has a little bit, maybe a little bit more apricot gene than, than some of the others. Shows that almost an apricot look, an apricot character. Uh, although the trees all look pretty much identical to Plum, flavor is really nice on this. It's a real refreshing piece of fruit. Almost has like a real light uh, lemony aroma to it, and just a, just a, you know a, a, a much different fluat than any other you would experience. Okay, here's, uh, here's the new one, Bella Gold Picotum. It's, uh, it's peach, it's uh, plum, it's apricot, uh, mm -hmm. and it has all those characteristics. And, and interestingly enough, the fruit has all those characteristics, which most of these don't. Uh, the fruit almost has a peachy, kind of a peachy, plummy flavor. The uh, tree almost has an apricot growing habit to it, although it's a big, wide, plum-type leaf, and it's a, it's a white bloom like a plum. Uh, we find it does best with a pollinizer, but I, I've heard that uh, in some of the uh, uh, self-fertile uh, trials, it's done fairly well, but I'm sure you're going to get 10 times more fruit with a pollinizer. And it will pollinate again with almost any plum or any Japanese plum or any other pluot. In fact, we recommend Flavor Grenade as the pollinator for, for Bella Gold. Flavor Grenade, uh, everywhere we put it in a trial, seems to bloom pretty much simultaneously. Gold. So flavor grenade is a good pollinizer. It's a um, early to early to mid uh, season variety. Uh, I've I've personally tried about 60 different picotum selections, and this one I have to admit is the one that I really think is a standout. Uh, there are a couple of sister plants to it. One called Bella Royale, but not a whole lot different than, than this one. And this one really was better than anything else in, in, it, in its parentage. So. This was the one that we chose to release. We'll probably release, once we get a, a good uh, succession of varieties that ripen over the season, we'll probably release three or four or five 
more picotums in the next few years. And you know, there are picotums that are as big as a large peach and picotums that are as small as a large cherry and uh, picotums that ripen anywhere from, from May through early October. So we'll have, we have all kinds of selections to work with. But I really think as far as flavor, uh, I'm going to have to see something that's, that's pretty incredible to beat this. So. I can't really tell you a whole lot about it, except, you know, grow it with flavor grenade. I can't tell you that it's low chill, but I can tell you from my personal experience and what I've looked at over the past 10 years as far as low chill characteristics, this one has it. It uh, has short inner nodes, it has a, a, a large uh, dominant flower, it blooms for a long period of time. So more than likely, this one is going to be uh, fairly low chill adaptable. And I'm really relying on you guys for that. I'm going to put it in my trial. I'm going to put it in three or four other trials in Southern California. But one of the great things that CRFG has done for me over the years is you guys are you guys are, are, are a testing ground that I, I couldn't pay to have as good a testing ground as you guys. You guys are growing fruit from the Mexican border to Oregon and into Arizona and Texas and, and you name it. And in all different climates in the southwestern United States. So I get more good information back from CRFG tests than I do from any of the other trials. So, you know, any of you guys that like to experiment, put in a bell of gold, give me your results. I'm interested in your results on, on anything that you put in. You guys are the reason that we're downgrading a lot of these chill hours. You guys are the reasons that we're listing different varieties as pollinators. Um, you guys have been a great source in providing information back to Zagre and Dave Wilson Nursery. And, and you know, I, I applaud you for that and want you to keep it up. So anybody that wants to experiment, here's your new one for this year. Now. And this, those this are available, those will be available? Those will be available for? this year with, with shipments for 2011. So after the uh, be week before Christmas, we'll start shipping. Now, I uh, was up in Northern California last week and did a walk of our inventory, did the last walk of Zagers, and we took our film crew and some of our guys up to the Wolfskill Experiment Station at UC Davis, and we toured their pomegranate plant. <coughs> you know, pomegranates right now are just red hot. Everybody's looking for, you know, special pomegranates. And the Wolfskill collection is really pretty incredible. They have about 300 pomegranate varieties in their collection. And they have um, the best grouping of varieties that came from the uh, experiment station in uh, Turkmenistan. So they have a lot of the varieties that are, that are, that are no longer in existence in, in Europe. I mean, when, when Russia broke up, that whole collection was basically destroyed. So a thousand different pomegranate varieties lost in obscurity. But um, UC Davis did have uh, an in there, and they did bring in about 20 different varieties. So the, the one I want to mention is a variety called Parvianca. Now, I tried 43 varieties myself last week when I was up there, and I'll tell you what, uh, I have never tasted a pomegranate variety that I liked as well as Parvianca. Parvianca is, is available through us this year, uh, was actually available last year. It's big. It's beautiful, it's bright, bright, fluorescent red color. It's a completely edible seed. It doesn't have a hard seed at all. Mm. It, uh, some of the flavors that the guys described it as were uh, cherry slurpee. It, it's, not, it's not bitter, it's not acidic, it's not, um, um, it's not, uh, what do I wanna say? No, it's not, it's not sour at all. It has a very, very pleasant, pleasant flavor, so. I've, I've tasted a lot of pomegranate varieties. I've never tasted 43 varieties together in one place. And, and, and considering that, considering that this, this was everybody's favorite, and it was also, it was the favorite out of the Turkmenistan collection of over a thousand varieties. And I can understand why. So if you guys really want a good quality pomegranate, look for Parvianca. It beats wonderful, hands down. It's a great, great quality piece of fruit. And uh, I think, you know, I don't know how well it would do right on the coast, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be adaptable. It certainly was uh, one of the champions up there. You know. Can you say that name a little louder? Parfianca. P A F R I A N K A. I think. Parfianca. P A F P A R F I N K A. I'm not sure. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Parfianca. Uh, you know, I just wanted to throw that in. I don't have a photo of it because you know, I just I just tried it for the first time myself last week. But let me tell you what, it's the most special pomegranate I've ever tried, and I've eaten a lot of pomegranates. Doesn't Dave Wilson say sell it by another name? No, 
Parvianca has never been grown under another name. It's only released under its, its true the type name. It's not in the category. I don't think it's in. It's in our new one. It's in the new one that's being printed right now, but it's not in that one. And um, thank you very much. Anybody have questions for Tom? Yes. I have a handful of citrus trees that are starting to bloom right now. Yeah, don't we all? Is that going to be a problem? Sure, it's going to be a problem. It's taking away uh, bloom potential for the spring. But, you know, the, uh, the daylight hours are shortening as we speak. Uh, the weather's changing, although it doesn't seem like it today. It's 85 degrees again in San Diego today. So, But, you know, that's the only thing we don't have any control over in Southern California is the weather. And a lot of these trees are going to respond to that. So, you know, I've got um, I've got pluots that are starting to bloom again. I've got mini royal cherry showing flowers. I've got uh, uh, dorset golden apple showing flowers now. And the only thing I can recommend to you, in, uh, the, other, the other thing that's going to influence bloom is, is how you fertilize so never fertilize late in the season. If you're going to feed fruit trees in general, you want to feed early. You want to start feeding at the end of January. You want to feed one more time in May, and that's it. Don't feed Guys, late in the keep summer. That, keep the ding down, please. It's getting hard to hear Tom over here. So, you know, that, that's going to have some influence on, on when trees bloom, but not as much influence as the weather. So we, we have no control over that. Yes? I had two uh, questions. Uh, I took a group of Chinese fruit growers up to Xavier's and also Wilson a few years back, mm -hmm. and I was absolutely fast, uh, amazed at what they're doing. I'm still amazed. Yeah, the Chinese, were, they wanted to bring them over to China. Of course they did. He, he didn't want to go. But uh, is there any way that we as a group or a small group could go and, and visit Xavier's maybe on Wednesday, or, I mean next year during the fruiting season? Or maybe so. I, I can't speak for Zagers on that. You would have to contact them directly and uh, and set up some sort of an appointment with them. Okay. Leith uh, Gardner is the one you would want to talk to. Leith Gardner. Leith Gardner. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now the other question I have: you you drive through the Central Valley and you see these big fruit trees and they chop the tops off. Uh, why is there more effort to convert them to smaller trees? Like more oh, there, there's absolutely an effort to convert them to smaller trees. There are. Oh yes. Uh, many, many growers are not growing anything over eight feet tall now. Oh, really? So hedgerow plantings have come into fashion, and due to the uh, high cost of uh, workman's compensation insurance yeah. and the issues with people falling off of ladders and climb, you know, falling out of trees, um, <laughs> growers are drastically reducing tree size. Oh. Do they have uh, dwarfs for all the major... Uh they're not concerned, as, well, again, they're not concerned whether the trees dwarf or not. They're concerned whether the rootstock is adaptable, yeah. their soil and their climate, and they'll make the trees dwarf. Right. Tree size is your responsibility. <laughs> yes? What persimmons are you interested in? I like all persimmons. My favorite persimmon is uh, definitely um, Jiro Fuyu. You know, you get your, probably the most bang for your buck on that. But I, I really like Nishimura Wase, which is we sell as coffee cake persimmon. Uh, as long as you have chocolate or hychea as a polymerizer, you get really good, non astringent fruit with that. But I tell you, I've never met a persimmon I didn't like. Any chocolate, others? are you talking about black sapota? When no. you said chocolate, there's a persimmon that is chocolate. a chocolate? Yeah, okay. the old variety chocolate. Okay. Cause okay. The Thank you very much. Black sapota is a persimmon. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, great presentation. We've all learned a lot. Have a lot of fun things to look forward to. Remember, all of the things Tom talked about tonight are available uh, through our special order fruit tree program. Thanks to Dave Archer over here at Benita Creek Nursery. Wave, Dave. Thank you very much, sir. Get your orders in. If you're interested in those. A couple of quick announcements before we break for the refreshment table. Um, that is the date change, well, not date change, but day change for the November and December meetings. Okay. Not the fourth Wednesday of the month in November or December. It's going to be November 17th, I believe. Is that it? For November 17th is our November meeting. We'll be talking about pruning fruit trees. Um, and then our holiday potluck 
is going to come up on December 17th? 16th. Which is a Tuesday. Thank you, CLO. December 16th, which is a Tuesday. Um, December 17th. November 16th, December 17th. I'm sorry. November 16th, December 17th. Thank you. It's on the website. It's also on the calendar right here. Are we starting early in December or regular time? It's 6.30 here. 6.30. Thank you very much. I thought we were. One of the things that you know we're going to really need your help on is... If we're going to be baking turkeys for the membership, um, we don't have anybody who's volunteered to do that at this point. So, if we, pardon me? The caterer? <laughs> if we're going to do that, we're going to need some folks to help out and step up. We'll definitely need people to help set the room up and to tear it down. And uh, we're planning some additional things for that holiday meeting. So if anyone is willing to help out on the uh, holiday party on December 17th, did I get it right? <laughs> December 17th, uh, please contact one of the board members or myself, and, and I, I'll uh, be glad to talk to you, or they'll be glad to talk to you about those things that you can help us with. There's going to be some special things that are going to happen, uh, some things to really look forward to. So, hope Dave sings again. So please, uh, if you have an opportunity to come to those meetings, join us. If you know any old members that maybe haven't joined us for a while, invite them back. You know, that's a great, great uh, social event, a great highlight to our meetings and, and wonderful, wonderful meeting. Um, so, with that, again, thank you very much, Tom, for coming all this way. Get your orders in if you're interested in any. We have a wonderful tasting table over there. And remember, we do need to be cleaned out and out of the meeting room no later than 10 o'clock. So, have a good night, everybody. Thank you for coming.